Uh, Grab your Bible and uh, turn to the Gospel of Luke, not Mark, but Luke, and uh, go to chapter 24. This morning we'll be reading from Luke 24, verses 36 to 53. Luke 24, starting in verse 36, if I could ask the congregation to rise, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. In verse 36, and as they, the disciples of Christ, were talking about these things, Jesus Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and blood, or flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. And he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is God's beloved, most precious word. Let it be received that way. You may be seated. Let's pray. Oh Lord God and our Father, we thank you for giving us your word. This precious word, this living and active word, this word that has no error, no falsehood, but is completely trustworthy in all that it teaches. Oh Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit here that your word would be taught faithfully and clearly this morning. But more than that, Lord, that you would bring your word to bear in our minds and our hearts, that we would see Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, more clearly today. And seeing him, we would believe in him. And seeing him, we'd grow in love for him. And we would be compelled today to share the good news of his death and resurrection with any who will listen, that they too may see him and believe and follow him. So to that end, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you had to summarize the entire Christian faith using one word, what word would you use? Salvation. Salvation. Resurrection. I'm looking for the Bible school answer, or the Sunday school answer. (laughs) Jesus, right? If I gave you two words to summarize the entire Christian faith, which would be your second word, I wonder? Cross? Cross? Cross and Jesus, those two words, I think, summarize well the entire Christian faith. And for us Christians, those two words should really summarize our our entire lives. 
Jesus and his atoning death are of utmost importance to us. We're in good company if we think those two words summarize the Christian faith. To the Corinthians, the apostle Paul wrote this, I decided to know nothing among you except this, Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2. But what if I give you a third word to summarize the Christian faith? Which word would you choose? Uh, If we were of the same mind as the Apostle Paul, then we would choose a word such as raised. Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received Here it is. First importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Of first importance, the apostle Paul wrote, is not only that Christ died and was buried, but also how Christ is risen. We spend a great deal of time thinking and praying and teaching and preaching about the crucifixion of Christ, and rightly so. But I do wonder if the church, generally speaking today, doesn't spend nearly enough time thinking about the fact that Christ is risen. If you were to take a look in the book of Acts at how the first Christians preached, you'd notice that at the heart of their messages was not only the death of Jesus, but also the resurrection of Jesus. The early church thought much about the resurrection of Jesus, and they preached a great deal about it. For the first Christians, the historical fact of the resurrection occupied the heart of their faith. The resurrection of Jesus was at the forefront of their minds and in the foreground of their preaching and their teaching because they knew that if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, there would not have been any good news to preach. The Apostle Paul, after he had thought much about the resurrection of Christ, said this in 1 Corinthians 15 to the Christians who lived in Corinth. Paul wrote this, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile or useless. And you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, died in Christ, have perished. If it is in Christ, Paul wrote, that we have hoped in this life only, we are all all people most to be pitied. Paul understood that if Jesus has not been resurrected from the dead, then your faith in Jesus is totally useless. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then you've placed your trust and your hope in a person who's still dead. If Jesus is still dead, then you're still enslaved to your sin. You're still under the wrath of God because of your sin. You're still separated from God. You're still facing the punishment of death for your sins, and those whom you love who have died believing in Jesus have gone to everlasting punishment. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, the dead then there would not be a gospel. There wouldn't be any good news. There wouldn't be a church, and there wouldn't be a future bodily resurrection to look forward to. If Jesus is dead, then we as Christians are most to be pitied because we've been taken captive by a great delusion. Probably the greatest delusion of all time. So it would be an understatement to say that the resurrection of Christ is important. (laughs) In the final section of the Gospel of Luke, which I just read for you a moment ago, what we have is an account of one of the appearances of Jesus on the Sunday after he was crucified. And before we move into the text, it's important to consider who the human author of these words is. The author is Luke. And according to the opening verses of chapter one of this book, we find out that Luke is something of an historian. He's poured a great deal of time and energy into collecting factual data. Factual data. 
on all that Jesus began to do and teach. Luke has gathered a lot of information, as if a journalist. A lot of information on the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And this information is from eyewitnesses. People who heard and saw all of this personally for themselves. And Luke has taken all of these facts and he's written down in an orderly fashion these facts to produce this historically grounded book so that we who are reading would have certainty concerning, among other things, the resurrection of Christ. Now, of course, we know the ultimate author of this book is God, who worked in Luke by the Holy Spirit to write down this account. So these words are, in fact, God's words to us. And therefore, these words we know are therefore entirely true without any kind of error or falsehood or deception whatsoever. Now, before we begin reading at verse 36, it's also important to note what has already happened in the narrative. In verse 36, it's still the Sunday after the crucifixion of Christ. Some people have already been to the tomb in which Jesus was buried, and they could not find the body of Jesus. However, there are others who have already seen Jesus alive. For example, according to John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene has already seen Jesus alive. According to Luke 24, beginning in verse 13, a certain Cleopas and another unnamed disciple have already seen Jesus while walking together on the road to the village of Emmaus. And if you look at verse 34 in our passage today, you see that Jesus has already appeared to the Apostle Peter, who is also called Simon. So a few people have already seen Jesus by the time we get to verse 36. However, with the exception of Peter, and uh, pardon me, with the exception of Peter, the apostles have not seen the resurrected Jesus yet. In fact, John chapter 20 tells us that Sunday evening had come and they still hadn't seen But John chapter 20 tells us that as they were huddled together that evening, they discussed reports of the resurrected Jesus. John chapter 20 tells us that all the apostles, minus Judas the betrayer and minus Thomas, were hiding out together in a locked room in Jerusalem. And they had locked their doors because they were afraid that the same Jews who killed Jesus might now come after them. So this is where we pick up in Luke 24, verse 36. Look at verse 36 with me. Luke writes this, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them, and he said to them, Peace to you. So imagine this, it's evening in Jerusalem. The sun has gone down. The apostles are meeting behind locked doors, afraid of being persecuted by Jews. They're talking about the death of Jesus, and now they're talking about the possibility that the reports of Jesus' resurrection are true, but most of them haven't seen for themselves when suddenly, without warning, Jesus appears. He didn't knock on the door. He didn't open the door and walk in, but rather one moment he isn't there, then in an instant, there he is. And look at the first words Jesus says to them in verse 36. He says, how are you doing? No, he says, peace to you. Does that seem like a strange thing to say? Peace to you. Something, this is, this is just we, Jesus' way of saying hi. <laughs> but I think there's more going on here. I think Jesus says this to them because he anticipates the way they're going to react to his sudden and unannounced appearance. He wants them to know he's the Prince of Peace who comes in peace and to give peace. Look with me at how the apostles react beginning in verse 37. But (laughs) they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Wouldn't you react this way? Can you imagine if Jesus suddenly appeared up here beside me? (laughs) 
Wouldn't you be startled a little bit? I know I'd be. <laughs> Say, Jesus, do you want to take over? <laughs> And the apostles were already gathered together with fear in their hearts. This appearance only intensified that fear, at least initially. They're startled, they're frightened. Verse 37 explains that part of the reason they were afraid was they thought they were looking at a spirit or a ghost. Something supernatural, something potentially dreadful. It would have been reasonable for them to conclude they were looking at a spirit. After all, it was, uh, it was their understanding that only spirits can move through the walls and close doors of a room and suddenly appear. It was not their understanding that spirits, spirits housed in bodies could do that. So surprise and fear washed over them, but there was something else going on in their hearts that caused them to be so surprised and afraid. Look at verse 38. Look at how Jesus responds to their surprise and fear. Verse 38, he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? This is the Jesus who knows everything. He can see right into the human heart. He's able to discern exactly what caused them to respond the way that they did. And Jesus knows they are troubled at least in part by doubts in their hearts. Do you know what they doubted? They doubted that Jesus had actually been resurrected bodily from the dead. Look back with me at verse 10. In verse 10, Luke writes, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. What things? That Jesus had been resurrected. And look at how the apostles react in verse 11. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Wow, these are the apostles, closest followers of Jesus. They didn't believe that Jesus had been raised. They doubted. They were skeptics. So when Jesus suddenly appeared, they were startled and afraid. And by the way, here's proof that the Bible is true, because this doesn't make them look very good, does it? Now look at how Jesus responds to his doubting disciples, beginning in verse 39. Jesus does not get angry with them, actually. He doesn't reprimand them sternly, nor does he mock them. In fact, he patiently meets them where they're at, and he does four things to help to believe that he has really been resurrected from the dead with a physical body. And by the way, if you're sitting here this morning, or if you're watching online, and you're not sure about all this Jesus being raised from the dead stuff, you're full of skepticism or you're full of doubt, know that God can meet you there. And he can help you to believe too. The first thing Jesus does to help his doubting disciples to believe is he shows them his hands and his feet. Look at verse 39. Jesus says, see, my hands and my feet, that it's I myself. Touch, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So at first, the disciples think they're looking at a disembodied spirit, a ghost. They doubt Jesus has been resurrected bodily, so he helps them. He invites them to examine his hands, his feet. Can you imagine being there in that room? What would you have done? I would have moved close to Jesus, probably with hesitation, <laughs> I would have reached out my hand and touched one of his hands. My heart would probably have been beating really fast the whole time. Would you have done that? If you had, you would have felt what they did. Flesh and bones, an actual body. Not just a spirit or a ghost. Then you'd look at Jesus' hand and then you look at his feet and you know what you'd see. You'd see. 
marks from the nails that had pierced him to the cross. And probably you would conclude, this is Jesus. <laughs> this is Jesus. This is Jesus the Lord, not just the spirit of Jesus, but also his body resurrected from the dead. The second thing Jesus does to help his disciples believe is he, he eats something. What a savior, full of grace and love and patience, not to stop there with his disciples, right? He continues to help them to believe. He wants them to be absolutely sure that he is alive and he has a, that he has a physical body. Verse 41 and while they disbelieved for joy and they were marveling, he said to them, got anything to eat? And they gave him a broiled fish and he took it and ate before them. What a scene. The disciples feed Jesus broiled fish. Can you imagine their eyes? Wide open watching intently as Jesus eats. If I had been there, I would, I would have watched him chew and swallow every bite. Watch his throat, you know that part where the throat goes down, you swallow. I might even even kept an eye on the ground to see if any fish fell down. Or if that food went to his stomach and digested I would have been watching, wouldn't you? I'd want to know, is this for real? Is this really Jesus in the flesh? Or is this some kind of spirit? I mean, somehow he got into the room without using the door. So Jesus eats. Like us, he chewed, he swallowed, he began to digest. He really had a body, a glorious resurrected body. The third thing Jesus does to help his doubting disciples believe that he's been raised bodily from the dead is he points them back to the scriptures. He wants them to rely not mainly on their senses, what they can see and feel, but he wants them to rely mainly on what God has said through his inspired written word. After all, our senses can deceive us, can they not? But the word of God will never deceive us. It's completely true. Therefore, it possesses exceedingly greater authority than our five senses. So in verse 44, look there. He says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, in other words, the entire Old Testament, must be fulfilled and what Jesus was doing here was pointing his disciples back to what he had taught them before his death. He had taught them that the entire Old Testament ultimately points to him and finds its fulfillment in him. Through Moses and through prophets like Isaiah and through the book of Psalms, God had foretold the arrival of Jesus the Messiah. In fact, God had foretold the Messiah's arrival and his mission long before he was born. For example, through Moses, God had spoken of the arrival of Jesus the Messiah more than 1,400 years before his virgin birth. And through Isaiah, some 700 years before his birth. In other words, Jesus had taught his apostles that he was the fulfillment of all those words that God in the Old Testament had spoken concerning the Messiah. But there's more that Jesus wants his disciples and more that Jesus wants us to understand about this. Jump down in your Bibles to verse 46. In verse, in verse 46, Jesus focuses our attention on a few particular truths concerning the Messiah that God foretold through the Old Testament and that Jesus has now fulfilled. Verse 46. Jesus said to them, thus it is written again, pointing to the scriptures, that the Christ, that is the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance 
and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that God the Father had foretold through the Old Testament that the Messiah would die and then be resurrected from the dead. Why? So that those who turn, turn away from their sins, that's what repentance means, who turn away from their sins and who surrender their lives to the Messiah will be forgiven of all their sins and reconciled to God. And Jesus wanted his, wanted his disciples to understand that God had foretold through the Old Testament that it was through this Messiah and the proclamation of this Messiah to all the nations that all the families of the earth would be blessed. Furthermore, Jesus wanted his disciples to know, to understand, he's that Messiah. Jesus wanted to understand that he died just as the Father foretold, and he was raised just as the Father had foretold. He wanted his disciples to understand so they would stop doubting. He wanted them to believe. He wanted them to be fully assured. He is risen with a glorious new body. And Jesus wants you and me to be fully assured as well. He wants us to be assured that he died and rose from the dead in fulfillment of God's word and God's promises and God's plan. Now, if you understand this, and you should give thanks to God this very moment in your hearts. And on the other hand, if you don't really understand the death and resurrection of Christ, or you see nothing beautiful about this, or if there's doubt in your heart that you're really struggling with, then cry out to God for him to help you to believe. Why do I say this? Look at verse 45. Did you notice I skipped that verse? Look at verse 45. What does it say? This is the fourth thing Jesus does to help his doubting disciples to believe. And this is what God can do for you. Verse 45, then he, Jesus, opens their minds. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In other words, the only reason the apostles understood and then truly believed that Jesus died for the sins on the cross according to the scriptures and then he was raised from the dead bodily according to the scriptures was because Jesus opened their minds. In fact, the only way any of us can understand the gospel of Jesus and respond by turning from our sins and placing our faith in Jesus is if God opens our minds to understand First Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 are so clear on this. It says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It also says the natural person that is the non-Christian. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he's not able to understand the Holy Spirit must absolutely go to work to open our minds and hearts so that we are able to hear and understand the gospel and respond with saving faith, confessing Jesus as Lord and, he, and that he is risen. So these are four things Jesus did to help his doubting disciples to believe. And the rest of our passage shows plainly that, uh, that although the disciples um, originally startled and afraid, full of doubt, they did end up believing. In fact, because of their firm belief that Jesus was raised, everything changed for them. Their lives were turned upside down or right side up. In the remainder of our passage, let me point out briefly just three things, three ways their lives changed and how I, our lives should be changed as well, because Jesus is alive. First of all, the resurrection of Jesus should radically change our lives because 
the resurrection proves that everything Jesus said about who he was and what he came to do is true. God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and by doing so, God put his divine stamp of approval, so to speak, on all that Jesus had said and done. Listen, if Jesus is still dead and buried, we shouldn't listen to anything Jesus said, because not only was he cursed on the cross, but also he was a liar and a lunatic to teach that he would be resurrected. But as it is, God the Father resurrected Jesus, validating and affirming that everything he said was true. And that changes everything. We need to hear and obey whatever Jesus said about who he was and what he came to do. And when we do, it'll change everything in our lives. Our lives cannot remain the same. I mean, we need to listen and really take to heart the fact that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And before Abraham was, I am, in effect, claiming to be God. We need to take that seriously. And we also really need to hear and take to heart what Jesus said about why he came down from heaven to earth. He said that he came to seek and to save the lost by giving up his life as a ransom for many. Jesus taught that all of us are born into this world totally lost and enslaved to sin. He knew we're wicked sinners who have rebelled against God above and who deserve the wages of our sin, which is death and subjection to the outpouring of the wrath of God for all eternity. Jesus knew and he taught that we needed to be saved. And so that's what Jesus came down to the earth to do. He came to save us. On the cross, Jesus died in our place in order to take upon himself all of our sin and the wrath of God that we deserve for those sins. And Jesus conquered death for us through his resurrection from the dead. And look at verse 47 of our text. It says the disciples were to to, to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins which is to say the only way God will forgive all of your sins against him is if you turn away from rebelling against him and turn towards Jesus Christ, surrendering your entire life to him as Lord and Savior. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. No exceptions. And that'll change everything. A second way the resurrection of Jesus should impact our lives is it should make us bold witnesses. Look at verse 48. Jesus said to his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. That is to say, the disciples had witnessed the death and resurrection of Jesus. Every disciple was a witness. And so is every Christian today. Sure, you and I have not seen the death and resurrection of Jesus with our physical eyes, but we have seen the death and resurrection of Jesus with the eyes of our hearts, have we not? Through the work of the Holy Spirit, the scriptures concerning his death and his resurrection have been brought to bear on our lives so that those events ring true to us every much, every bit as much as they did to the first disciples. And in this sense, if you're a Christian, you're a witness. And you and I should be bold witnesses. You and I should be witnesses who are learning to, learning to speak with confidence and courage concerning the factuality and the meaning of the death and resurrection of Christ our Lord. And why do I say bold witnesses? For two reasons. Number one, we as Christians have been clothed with the power of God the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 49. Jesus says, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. 
but stay in the city. They can wait to go out. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus meant they were going to be clothed in the power of the Holy Spirit to be bold and effective witnesses. The same is true of us Christians. We have been given God the Spirit so that we not only know the truth and believe the truth, but are confident in the truth so that we can go out and share the truth with the law. But there's another reason reason we should be bold in our witnessing. Look at verse 50. Luke writes, Then he, Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. That's amazing. You know why we should be Bold, confident witnesses for Jesus sharing the gospel with any who will listen because the Lord Jesus Christ is not buried someplace in a tomb, but rather he's sitting at the right hand of glory, at the right hand of God in heaven this very moment, overseeing us and protecting us. And interceding for us every moment of every day as we reach out with the gospel. In Matthew 28, Jesus said that we are to make disciples of all nations. Knowing this, he is with us always to the end of the age. We should be bold witnesses because Jesus is alive. And he is with us overseeing us and leading us and working through us for his glory. A third and final way the resurrection of Jesus to change our lives is it should cause us to worship God joyfully together. Look at verse 52. And the disciples worshipped Jesus And returned to Jerusalem, dragging their feet with solemn faces. What does it say? Great joy. I imagine them skipping, (laughs) jumping up and down, going to the temple, it says, continually in the temple, blessing God, an eruption of praise day after day. What an image! of followers of Jesus full of exceeding joy. And what a picture we're given here of their eagerly gathering together regularly to praise God and to make music to God and to make much of God. I doubt anyone had to phone any of the disciples and say, I haven't seen you at the temple in a while. Are you going to come? Worship with us? Well, I'll be honest, my worship isn't always a joyful noise to the Lord. Sometimes it's just a noise. Something that I need to confess when that happens and turn away from it. How about you? What needs to happen when our hearts are down and weak and weary and lacking in joy? What needs to happen so that we worship in spirit and truth, not just here on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week? What needs to happen so that we worship in spirit and truth with with passion and conviction? Well, why were these disciples in Luke 24 worshiping with so much joy? The answer is the Jesus who died for us is no longer buried in a tomb. Instead, he's alive. It changes everything for us who believe. Because Jesus is alive, we know that through faith in him, we've been also made spiritually alive through the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is alive, we know that through union in him, with him, we can also look forward to our own future bodily resurrection from the dead. Because Jesus is alive, we know that we have a high priest interceding for us at the right hand of God this very moment whenever we sin. Uh, Because Jesus is alive, we know that our faith is not futile, but rather that through our faith in Jesus, we've been set free from the bondage to sin, and we've been set free to enjoy and glorify God forever. 
And because Jesus is alive, we know that just as he promised, he will one day come back on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and gather his elect from the four winds to himself. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this gospel, this beautiful, powerful, wonderful, life-saving, life-transforming gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ died in our place for our sins, was buried on the third day, was raised from the dead, that all who believe in him would be forgiven of all our sin and reconciled to you. Thank you for this gospel by which we've been saved. For any who do not yet believe, who are listening, I pray you would work in their minds and hearts to bring them to Christ. They would call upon his name and believe in him. And I pray that as we go out, Lord, we go out with joy, with bold confidence that our Christ is risen indeed. And that this gospel would advance in the community of Shawville and beyond. That many would see Jesus, bend the knee, confess with their mouths he is Lord and rejoice in him as Savior. We ask in his name. Amen.